My name is Audrey Denning, and I'm a senior political economy major here at the college, and I have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Charles T. Rubin. Charles T. Rubin is the Marie Clement Rodier Endowed Cha Chair Professor at Duquesne University. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and Political Science at Case Western Reserve and a PhD in Political Science at Boston College. A recipient of the Madison Visiting Fellowship in the James Madison Program for American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University, Dr. Rubin is a contributing editor at The New Atlantis. His current research and publications focus on emerging technologies, such as nanotechnology and artificial intelligence, and the idea that they will allow for the redesign of humanity. He is editor of Conservation Reconsidered, Nature, Virtue, and American Liberal Democracy, and he is author of The Green Crusade, Rethinking the Roots of Environmentalism, and Eclipse of Man, Human Extinction, and the Meaning of Progress. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Rubin. Thank you. I'm the after-dinner entertainment, right? That's a... It's wonderful to be... No. <laughs> uh, it's wonderful to be here at Hillsdale. I've, I've, I've known of this place for years and years and years. And even as I began to know people who came here, like my good friend Will Morrissey, uh, it still had, had the aura of a kind of a Shangri-La or Brigadoon or... But, but now I'm here, right? And so that's, that's, it's, it's wonderful. <clears throat> it's one of the great truisms of our time that our ethics need to catch up with our technology, or that we stand in need of some new technological ethics. The challenge may be posed in this very general form, or it may be related to some particular technological innovation. As, was the supposed, as with the supposed need for some new ethic to cover the life and death choices made by computer-piloted cars, or with respect to privacy issues, or in relation to genetic engineering, or brain-machine interfaces. The underlying idea seems to be pretty much the same in all cases. Technology has given us some unprecedented power over nature and over each other which in turn grants us new powers of action and consequent novel choices that will require an equally novel ethical outlook. The observation that these unprecedented powers may in one way or another threaten the very existence of human beings as such or of life on Earth more generally is not infrequently adduced to add urgency to this call for ethical innovation. Certainly, the premises of this argument are very hard to deny. They are, in some respects, the most obvious thing about the world we encounter day to day. Were our culture less steeped in the love of novelty than it is, it might be easier to elevate the call for a new technological ethic from truism to simply truth. But as it stands, I think there is some prima facie reason for being suspicious of ideas that fits so well within our intellectual inclinations or prejudices. After all, it is very flattering to modernity, tightly bound as it is to the Baconian project of the conquest of nature for the relief of man's estate, to grant that it has been so successful at altering the conditions of human life as to require a reconsideration of fundamental ethical categories. Less abstractly, the call for a new technological ethic is a kind of pensioner's praise of our flesh and blood technological elite, the masters of disruption, who, to their great delight and profit, aim to make all that is solid melt into thin air. Now, in principle, another of the great characteristics of the modern world, enlightenment, might exempt us from such worries that our vision of what technology is and does is subject to all of the strictures of Socrates' allegory of the cave. Yet it could still be true that most of us, most of the time, at least with respect to the things most familiar to us, are content with a world of opinions whose relationship to the truth is, as we might say, casual. 
Fortunately for us, our dilemma, our, any effort to resolve a dilemma about whether we do or do not need a new technological ethic to deal with the novel circumstances technology seems to create for us is vastly assisted by the work of 20th century philosopher Hans Jonas. Long before it was fashionable, Jonas articulated an argument for a new technological ethic, not so different from what I have just outlined, but very carefully and very insightfully thought through. By his own account, Jonas's extended meditations on this topic began in the late 1950s and culminated in a, a book that in English came to be known by the title, The Imperative of Responsibility in Search for an Ethics for the Technological Age. This is a 1984 translation of works that had been published in German in 79 and in 81. The book is said to have inspired European Green parties and also to have contributed to the thinking behind what becomes known as the precautionary principle. I'm not sure either of these uh, uh, relationships are, represent the most accurate reflection of Jonas's own thinking or intention. But of course, influential authors don't get to choose always the nature of their influence. I'm not going to enter tonight into, into a discussion of this book with anything close to the depth and breadth that it deserves. But I will try to lay the premises upon which Jonas based his argument for a new technological ethic before you and suggest why I think that one could actually accept his premises more or less at face value and still believe that the challenge technology poses for us is better met by a return to an older understanding of ethics than progress to a new one. Jonas's view of the dangers posed by the altered conditions of human choice and action created by modern technology means, as he understood full well, that we will increasingly need to restrain and constrain our own choices if we wish to protect the integrity of human life and the larger natural world. But that undertaking, it seems to me, forces us to take seriously not some new ethic, but the ancient task of ethics, habituating our reason and emotions to work together to control our infinite desires. Here let me note my debt to C.S. Lewis for this concise and to my mind generally applicable account of what I'll be calling the old ethics. All right, so Jonas's argument for a new technological ethic is founded on showing how the old ethic is based on assumptions that are simply no longer true. First, that the human condition and human nature are fixed once and for all. Second, that the basis of knowing what human nature is, that on, on the basis of knowing what human nature is, the human good is readily determinable. Those are her, his words. Not sure Socrates would agree, but they're his words. Third, that the realm of human responsibility is relatively tightly constrained by an abiding naturally given that transcends human capacities. Now note that Jonas is not speaking here about the content of any particular old ethic. He's talking about the underlying circumstances which he believes called forth the ethics of the ancient and indeed the early modern world and perhaps even uh, all the way up to Kant. Now to elaborate on the difference between the old situation and the present situation with respect to the impact of technology, he derives four additional points from the famous second chorus of Sophocles' play Antigone. Right, this is the Many things cause terror and wonder, yet nothing is more terrifying and wonderful than man. Are we, is it? Can I read it to you? <laughs> um, Many things cause terror and wonder, yet nothing is more terrifying and wonderful than man. This thing goes across the gray sea on the blasts of winter storms, passing beneath waters, towering round him. 
the earth, eldest of the gods, unwithering and untiring. This thing wears down as his plows go back and forth year after year, furrowing her with the issue of horses. This thing ensnares and carries off the tribe of light-minded birds, the companies of wild beasts, and the sea's marine life with coils of woven meshes, this keenly skilled man. He has power through his ways over the beast who traverses the mountains and haunts the open sky, the shaggy mane horse he tames with yoke, and the untiring mountain bull. Both language and thought swift as wind and impulses that govern cities he has taught himself, as well as how to escape the shafts of rain while encamped beneath open skies. All resourceful, he approaches no future thing to come without resource. From Hades alone, he will not contrive to escape. Refuge from baffling diseases, he has devised. Possessing a means of invention, a skillfulness beyond expectation, now toward evil he moves, now toward good. By integrating the laws of the earth and justice under oath sworn to the gods, he is lofty of city. Cityless, he is the man with whom ignobility because of his daring dwells. May he never reside at my hearth or think like me, whoever does such things. From this account of the human condition, which, by the way, is by no means simply confirmed by the other choruses of Antigone, um, Jonas concludes first, very unsurprising observation, that techne is equally capable of being put to good or bad uses. Second, that ethics are essentially about human to human relationships. And third, that what it means to be human is fixed. Finally, in Jonas's reading, the chorus teaches that the realm of ethics is focused on the local and the short term, the world of the city, meaning that it has relatively modest cognitive requirements, particularly with respect to matters where prediction might come into play. Here again, I want to stress, Joan, Jonas is not so much talking about the content of any particular pre-modern ethic. He's trying to understand the circumstances that those ethics were responding to. In order to develop, then, the contrast with our current situation. Our circumstances are such that human nature and the human condition are no longer fixed. Arguably already, technology has altered the human condition in serious ways by, for example, significant life extension and the alleviation in so many parts of the world of the tightest constraints of natural scarcity. But more and more, we can and do imagine and aspire to using technology to more radical alterations of our own biologically given. Secondly, the productive infrastructure that makes these alterations possible has had an impact on the workings of natural ecosystems, has, in fact, many would say, worn away the oldest of gods. We might debate how much that impact has been, whether they are better or worse, but they've happened. Certainly, we have grown accustomed to thinking that the fate of the earth has somehow become our responsibility. Under these circumstances, choices that follow from the ethical neutrality of technology become considerably more consequential. We are way beyond the knife that can be used to save a life in surgery or take a life in passion. Our, technolog our technological choices have the potential for radical changes to the naturally given, changes that we would be global and multi-generational in scope. The consequences would therefore extend far beyond what we see in front of us in space and time, so that the ability to know whether or not we are doing the right thing becomes a matter at best involving complicated judgments by specialists, and at worst, 
a matter that exceeds present human capacities to, to predict the future. Hence, we tell ourselves, nature as such, which in any case we have largely shorn of moral significance by the turn to modern scientific materialism, can no longer serve as that ready guide to hu the human good. And of course, as far as any guide to the human good, we are skeptics, culturally speaking, about the extent to which any such guidance is even possible. It is fashionable to eschew universalistic master narratives and favor instead the free play of moral individualism. Putting these points together, I think we can say Jonas believes that technology has widened and deepened the scope of our actions beyond what old ethics imagined. In doing so, it has increased both factual and moral uncertainty with respect to the consequences of our actions. The existence of a natural order that transcended human capacity meant that the bad consequences of ethical failings or misjudgments would be localized, however terrible they might be within that local context. In contrast for us, lacking any normative conceptions drawn from nature, we find ourselves living on a kind of light knife's edge of global disaster. So Jonas's account of things. A little later in the book, Jonas will endorse what he calls a heuristics of fear. That is to say, he encourages thinking about the future in light of the worst case. And it is more than likely that already in this first chapter, he's engaged in that enterprise. It's possible then that his dire view of the future possibilities should be moderated. Moderated first by reminding ourselves of the benefits we regularly accrue from our technological prowess, like the fact that we're all here tonight. How can human beings in advanced technological societies not be grateful for lives that are so much less poor, nasty, brutish, and short than the historical norm? Solitary being the one outlier here. Our ingenuity regularly allows us to address problems of material existence that at no great distance of generations would have been regarded as without solution. And despite decades, if not centuries, of warnings about passing points of no return, we continue to make this variety of, moral pro of, of material progress. Excuse me. There are, it seems to me, three things wrong with this admittedly very powerful response to Jonas's more dire conclusions. The first is that it doesn't deal with the classic joke, right? The man who jumps off a high building and so he says, as he's passing the 42nd floor, how's it going? Fine, he calls back. We don't know. The second is that although it seems to have a quarrel with Jonas, it is, in fact, just another route to reaching Jonas's own conclusion about the need for a new technological ethic. For if indeed we do live in a world of perpetual material progress and ever-increasing comfort, that fact alone might be enough to force us to rethink any ethics that are not correspondingly dynamic and that are predicated on limits beyond our power to control. But a third point in support of Jonas's rather dire picture is, for me anyway, the most dispositive. He was writing, certainly, very much under the influence of the environmentalist views of the 50s, 60s, and 70s that we faced more or less immediate prospects of ecological disaster. But it's not clear to me that that kind of problem really was his core concern. He saw from early on the world we now live in where the threat of human extinction from our stupidity or cupidity in treatment of natural ecosystems is at least matched and I think exceeded by the threat that comes from the use of technology for deliberate projects of human extinction. Projects undertaken in the name of a charitable effort to correct all the manifest defects of our naturally given being, foremost among which, of course, is our mortality. 
call it what you will, it goes under many names, transhumanism, posthumanism, singularitarianism, extropianism, H+, the desirability of replacing fragile biological humans with some instantiation of intelligence, initially at least in some sense of our own design, but in any case an instantiation that is more capable and more robust than we are, may not be the most broadly held opinion in our society, but it is increasingly an opinion held by those in the technology sector who are taking some of the most consequential steps towards that future, whether they intend it or not. Despite the fact that it is acknowledged to be formally incomprehensible to merely human intelligences such as our own, this post-human vision of the future increasingly also excites the imaginations of some of our most creative thinkers. I'm thinking of science fiction authors who are constantly straining to write comprehensible novels about a future that is supposed to be incomprehensible to mere human beings. It's a challenge. For these reasons, I'm going to accept tonight Jonas's conclusion that modern technology challenges us with novel circumstances. But does that mean we need a novel ethic to respond to the challenge? About this second claim, I'm skeptical. Jonas himself believes he's identified a novel ethical principle, more precisely an ethical imperative, that will be the basis for the restraint we must exercise to make sure that human life persists into the future. Quoting now, act so that the effects of your action are compatible with the permanence of genuine human life. Or expressed negatively, act so that the effects of your action are not destructive of the future possibility of such life. Or simply, do not comp compromise the conditions of an indefinite continuation of humanity on Earth. You'll hear, all of you, some of you, the sort of baleful influence of Kant here on Jonas, but that's what he thinks. This is the substance of the, of the new ethic. This imperative is novel because only in our own time has it become necessary. Only in our own time has human power become sufficiently consequential to, to require we bring the existence of humanity into the, indef into the indefinite future under the umbrella of our ethical concern. It is evident that this imperative would put us on a path of thinking that could ground the rejection or use of certain technologies or their development, although as Jonas understands, it requires a predictive ability to know whether we would need to do so, that in any given case may be anywhere from controversial to non-existent, although that too is an aspect of its novelty. But here's the thing, the mere articulation of the imperative neither requires that we use it or act on it. It would have to be appropriately institutionalized or operationalized to become an actual, an actual source of restraint. Of course, all ethical theories face the same challenge. But I think it takes on altered significance in the context of Jonas's analysis. I'm going to see if I can explain by use of a specific example. I don't think it does great violence to Jonas's position to reframe it in terms of a more common rubric, the concern for future generations. Indeed, another of Jonas's own formulations is, do not compromise the conditions of the indefinite continuation of humanity on Earth. Now, we are often told that concern for future generations is deficient today, that we live too much for the present, too much for ourselves. We are not exercising due foresight. There, you know, I think there's something to that criticism. Uh, you know, living for the moment is one of the characteristics of our particular time. It is certainly possible to find times and places where there was a much greater concern for future generations than we routinely express. It is commonly expressed, it seems to me, as part of an aristocratic ethos. After all, the present holder of land or a title is just a steward 
for what previous generations have bequeathed him, sorry, it is usually a him, and what he will, as just one link in that great chain, leave behind him. And of course, to some degree, that view is expressed at the other end of the social spectrum as well, right? Where, the, where you know, the peasant classes believe themselves perpetually bound under those circumstances. They look forward and backward, and they see exactly the same thing, too. Now, however natural this outlook may appear to a given aristocrat living in a time of its full flowering, in fact, it requires tremendous discipline and cultivation to maintain it. How do we know that? Well, you can see that's true when these aristocratic worlds start to enter a period of decline. You know, read Trollope, read uh, Edith Wharton, and you see as these arist aristocracies are crumbling around the edges, you get a very good sense of all the things that used to happen that are no longer happening. Habituating reason and emotions to control desires to support the aristocratic ethos requires authoritative legal supports, specific forms of education, intensive social pre pressures, ruthlessly supporting specific manners and mores. Not to speak of a multitude of material conditions, right? What's a good aristocratic house without the grand staircase with all the ancestor portraits in it, right? Or the long hallway. Absent this supporting framework, remnants of an aristocratic ethos are likely to appear comical or vicious or ridiculous, as is nicely suggested by some of the episodes of Matthew Weiner's new show, The Romanoffs. Anybody seen that? Not so much. That's I think that's what you're seeing, not in all the episodes, but in some of the episodes. We know, in short, how to cultivate a concern for future generations within the framework of the old ethics. We've seen it done, right? Believe in it, we've seen it, yeah? The restraints that it cultivated are, it must be said, responses to the limitations under which Jonas, sorry, Jonas argued old ethics operated. That fact leads some to conclude that the methods by which we were to cultivate any concern for future generations today would have to be different. Indeed, it is almost a commonplace today to frame the achievement of ethical behaviors in terms of genetic or biochemical engineering. See, for example, the, a book titled Unfit for the Future, The Need for Moral Enhancement by Ingmar Pearson and Julian Savulescu. This is an Oxford University Press book, by the way. This is not some you know, non-mainstream way of thinking. Uh, but if such methods are not themselves outright violation of Jonas's imperative, they are at least a slippery slope very much in tension with it. So if we wanted to cultivate a concern for future generations, the fashionable way of doing so, the Pearson and Savulescu way, is not available to us. So we could operationalize Jonas's imperative in a different way. Couldn't we try to use the same kinds of legal and social tools that were used to support the aristocratic ethos? But now we have to stop and think. Were we to do so, what would we be saying about the actual novelty of our ethical circumstances? Neither the means nor the ends that define the ethos of concern for future generations would actually be new at all. We just have to become more aristocratic. To reach this conclusion, I had to shift Jonas very slightly off his own ground. But the point would remain largely the same, even with a more precise representation of his starting point. His imperative cannot enforce itself, and given the terms of his argument, may not be consistently enforced using the most aggressive technological tools that call forth its demand for restraint in the first place. Right? This, isn't, this is a problem of technology that, if he's right, technology cannot solve. That would just make the matter worse. It appears as if it could only be enforced, consistent with Jonas's own concerns, by the use of the traditional methods 
by which any ethic is to be cultivated. What it amounts to then is suggesting that if those methods are not grounded in the most radical possibilities of technological manipulation of the given, we would have to choose to say, so much the worse for those radical possibilities. But if we get this far, it seems to me we might start wondering how much Jonas's imperative adds to what we might achieve, not just by the means of an old ethic, but by the ends as well. For example, if a major threat to the future of mankind is the excessive material consumption that threatens the viability of natural ecosystems, people are going to have to consume less. Teaching the imperative responsibility is not going to reduce consumption any more than teaching Aristotelian moderation would. But would not habituation to moderation serve as an adjunct that could operationalize Jonas's imperative? Or again, the imperative of responsibility surely gives us one perspective from which to understand what is wrong with the aspirations of those who seek to facilitate human extinction in the name of technological progress. But on the other hand, it is not exactly breaking news that efforts to cheat death are prideful, hubristic, and very likely to go bad. Either way, an old ethic of humility would be an appropriate response. But then what would we lose if we started to think about humility as a good in itself, just as we might come to understand in the old way moderation as good? Now, if we become skeptical about the proposition that our admittedly novel circumstances require a correspondingly novel ethic, we might even be tempted by the argument that Jonas concedes too much to the ethic of novelty, or as we might say, disruption, that is so prominent in our technological aspirations. The choices we make that could lead to the most dire outcomes, right? The quest for immortality. How did we get to the point where that's what we're looking for? If, as Jonas does, we accept them as the necessary consequence of novel circumstances, that's one thing. We would just have to say, as, as Stuart Brand said a long time ago, uh, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. But that's not Jonas. That these are the choices we are faced with might otherwise be taken as symptoms of the disordered priorities which arise in disordered souls. We see this all the time in small ways. We bear our souls on Facebook and then worry ourselves about privacy. <laughs> we race to develop autonomous cars, even as we worry about the danger of technology out of control. We rail at the indignity of death, but then we demand death with dignity. We say we want a new technological ethic, but of course, you'll have to let us do whatever we want to do. Hence, it seems to me, it's appropriate to think in terms of that old ethic whereby the reason by means of trained emotions could control our desires. Yes, it's old fashioned. And yes, that may sound quaint to some of you. And because it's quaint, it may seem like it could not possibly have any kind of impact in a real world. But if impractical, impracticality is a problem for my argument, it is, it seems to me, an even greater problem for those who advocate some new ethic. And here again, it's only our prejudice on behalf of novelty that blinds us to the impracticality of the new ethic. For as Jonas himself understands full well, it is far easier to call for a new ethic or even develop one than to imagine one that could be adopted today as the right ethic, since in our time, the intellectual domination of relativism, postmodernism, and general moral skepticism and laxness, we find ourselves in a situation where the notion of any authoritative ethic has become almost impossible to uh, take seriously in theory. 
Yet, as far as practical affairs go, the, more cap the moral capital we are in fact expending day by day is almost by definition derived from some old ethic as it remains more or less weakly embodied in law, customs, norms, and so on. So if it were the case that we simply had a choice between trying to revive and invigorate what already exists and starting over from zero, I think there's some practical reason to favor the former and see the latter as the impractical choice. If our goal is to protect the future of the human race and the conditions for human life on Earth for future generations, we are going to have to find some ways to exercise restraint with respect to at least the widespread development of, or perhaps use of, certain technological possibilities. While an imperative responsibility could help clarify our deliberations, it will not enforce itself. Unless we use some of the novel tools of technology to control the use or development of other tools of technology, an outcome seemingly at odds with Jonas's own purposes, restraint will require self-control, and self-control the proper ordering of our souls. We really have no choice but to employ our intellects and emotions to help keep the animal organism under control. Up to this point, I think it is fair to say when today we have even thought to ask questions of what technologies to develop or restrain, the burden of proof has quickly been assigned to restraint, and the default assumption has been that to attempt to restrain is an unwarranted assault on scientific or commercial or medical freedom, a risky enterprise to our economic well-being or national security. I think it is worth considering the possibility that the voice of freedom in such debates is actually the voice of what Lewis calls our animal organism, what Socrates would have labeled the hydra that is the desiring part of our souls. There are good reasons why this should be the case. After all, technology from the start has played a crucial role in the achievement of the comfortable self-preservation that is the hallmark goal of modern politics. Modern political arrangements have increasingly made their peace with understanding human life as a perpetual and restless desire for power after power, to quote Hobbes, ceasing only in death. Here again, we should never slight the good that has come as a result, but over the course of time, it has become increasingly clear that these results include the liberation of the hydra, and as one might say, the deliberate pruning of its heads in order to increase their number. There are, these conditions make it very difficult for us to distinguish between liberty and license. We are very little inclined to ask whether the freedoms we are protecting are anything more than further enslavement to the hydra of our desires. You see this in the prospect, in the promises that are made on behalf of immersive virtual realities that we will at last be able to fulfill all of our wildest dreams and desires. Or again, I would adduce uh, I'm not going to tell you to search this out on the internet, but I, I, th there was a wonderful interview in connection with the uh, Consumer Electronics Show of a guy who, who's making sex dolls. Right? And uh, one of the big features, not yet available, but coming soon, uh, was that these dolls would have under interchangeable heads and personae. Right? Good, right. <laughs> Somebody sees it. Um, Lest we think this designer was in any way infected by cis-normativity, he made it clear that his company eventually expected the complete compatibility and interchangeability of female and male heads, bodies, and personae. Is it really some principled commercial understanding of commercial and intellectual freedom that would hold us back from drawing a, some kind of line at sex robots? Or is it one head of the hydra cherry of interfering with another, lest it be interfered with. I don't know whether Jonas would count these two examples I've given as among those that threaten the future and integrity of our humanity, as I think I would, but the Hydra's desire for power after power now emphatically includes that the quest not end in death. 
The fact that we are nowhere close to this seemingly perennial goal, the fact that it is not even clear that we are on the verge of any extension of lifespan as significant as the one that took place during the 20th century, does not, I think, one whit diminish the seriousness of the undertaking to achieve freedom from death. It could be true to say, it seems to me, both that the revolt against death is a great sign of our humanity and that men who are not mortal are no longer men. The desire to conquer death could be a perennial powerful head of the hydra. The best way to deal with it, the way that most expresses the genuine freedom that comes from the ability of reason and thumos, or reason or intellect and emotion to restrain desire, is not likely to be to give in to it. <clears throat> None of us, I dare say, look forward to death, except under God willing the rarest of circumstances, and I have some regret in bringing my remarks to a close on this topic. But the quest to overcome death motivates our great tech barons no less than it motivated the alchemists. So in many respects, it is likely to be one of the places where, as Jonas suggests, we would want to restrain technology if we were willing to do so at all. But here of all places, I think it is clear that the new ethic of the imperative of responsibility actually brings nothing new to the table, even misses all of what the old ethics offered for dealing with the reality of death. Things like the cultivation of resignation or of hope. Short of dehumanizing biotechnological interventions to faith death, f face death faithfully or philosophically are alike difficult tasks, tasks of a lifetime as one might say, that these all too human tasks are not always, perhaps not even frequently actually completed is not enough to justify, justify wholesale manipulations of our nature. In a world where some of our best and brightest, or at least richest, are pursuing or supporting projects whose goal would be the elimination of humanity, it is not hard, sorry, it is hard not to have intellectual sympathy with Jonas's attempt to articulate an ethic that favors the preservation of humanity into the indefinite future. It may seem that the novelty of the goal would require us to respond to it with corresponding novelty as he, have, he has done. But I've tried to show tonight why I think it's not so simple. The old ethics was always, in a sense, about the preservation of our humanity, delicately poised as it is between the pull of beastliness and the pull of godlike self-sufficiency. The old ethics knew that left to themselves, most people would lead the lives of cattle. And I have to say, it often seems to me that the promise of technology today is to find ever more sophisticated ways to keep us well pastured. On the other hand, there is the more visionary promise that we are on the verge of becoming homo deus, as uh, the title of a recent book put it, of transcending our humanity so that intelligence shorn of all limitation of our poor biological bodies and minds can increasingly transform the world in its own image. The answer of the old ethics to both these anti-human impulses was the same, a due regard for the proper ordering of our souls with regard, which regard is the hallmark of our humanity. We would gain thereby the restraint necessary to be able to withstand the siren songs of our subhuman and superhuman desires. I don't think we must believe that there has yet been any fundamental change to that situation. As the same things attract us, the same powers will need to be invoked to resist them. The threat of technology to our humanity can best be met perhaps only be met by human beings who know what it means to live like human beings and are habituated to doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Rubin has agreed to sign copies of his book, Eclipse of Man, Human Extinction and the Meaning of Progress, immediately following the lecture. We now have time for a few questions. Please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to be brought to you. Hi. Um, here I can see. There we go. Um, so this is kind of a particular question, but you talked about how ethics are person to person. 
And I'm wondering, like for example, the cell phone and like the ability for us to be in contact with each other rapidly and across um, a much larger space than we've seen before. How, if, if we're if we're trying to recover an ancient ethics, like you said, how will the development of the cell phone or stuff like that aid in recovering that? Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I, I think so, but you'll you'll tell by my answer whether or not I, I understood. Um, cell phones are a very problematic invention uh, from from this point of view. I mean, yes, it can keep us in contact with each other over over long distances, and there are many wonderful things that result from that. But there is also a kind of diminishment of what it means to communicate one human being with another that takes place. So, you know, all the myriad of clues that we get when we speak face to face with someone, you know, are, are missing. Uh, even when we're, you know, video chatting, they are, they are imperfectly represented, it seems to me. Um, and so some aspect of, of human communication gets filtered out of the process. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough that I manage, you know, I can remember a time when, when to go on a date or something, you actually ask someone face to face. I mean, So um, even if we in the West were able to um, become closer with that old ethics, uh, master that moderation, that sort of social responsibility um, that we need, how, how would we transmit that, communicate that to the non-Western parts of the world in which it's, it's needed most, for example, in China and India or, or uh, places that have large carbon sinks like Africa and South America? How, yeah. how can we yeah, yeah, yeah. get the rest of the world on board? Yeah, so... Um, I, I've, I've heard questions like that many times now, and I, yet, I have yet to come up with what I regard as a remotely satisfactory response. Um, I'll just say two very quick things. First of all, you know, there's always something to be said for getting your own house in order. And, 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 and you know, if, 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 if we were to get our house in order, and if it were to have positive consequences, then it may be that other people would, seeing that would be interested in getting their house in order in, in like-minded ways. Uh, the other answer I give you, sorry, but it's, it's one of the best works of science fiction that I've ever read, extremely intelligently written. It's uh, Neil Stevenson's The Diamond Age, or a young, oh shoot, sorry? A Young Girl's Illustrated Primer. And Stevenson imagines a world where, um, way beyond the nation state, but uh, uh, you know, like-minded groups of people um, follow the ethics which define them as peoples and end up in competitive and sometimes dangerous situation, and there is a kind of overarching but rather loose governance of the whole system. Um, it just, it's, it's, a book worth, it's a book worth reading, you know, for, for the manner in which he takes, you know, old ethics seriously and brings it into a, a radically new world. Uh, if we want to presume, uh, preserve our future generations, uh, would it be wise not to militarize our new artificial intelligence? Yes. Uh, but, but, but let me answer that in a qualified way. I mean, because again, it, the, these two questions, in my mind anyway, are related. We live in a tough world. We, we live in a competitive world. Um, you know, you, there are things that you, you know, national security is very important and has to be taken seriously in making these decisions. Um, already fighter plane pilots rely on tremendous amounts of computer assistance and natural and, and artificial intelligence. I mean, stealth planes, I am told, could not be flown by a human being operating alone. Um, as we do this, I think it's very important to keep human beings right 
in the loop in authoritative decision making uh, roles. I do not believe in the development of that the, the development of autonomous artificial intelligence military technology is a good idea at all. Thank you for your talk today. Um, to me, to be truly human and be tethered to humanity is two things is to one to believe in a supreme being or God, and also to believe in our mortality. And to me, too many of the Silicon Valley sultans believe that they are God and that they can manipulate things to live forever. And when you, when you cease mooring yourself to those two things of believing in a supreme, of believing in God and believing in, in your mortality, and you think you can do anything else, bad things can happen. And also thinking that, and these are just comments of mine I'd like for you to comment. Technology to me is a tool that we use. It, it should not be something that is used on us, that it becomes, that we become a tool of it. Thank you. <clears throat> no, thank you. I mean, I, I, I alluded, it's true, only very delicately uh, to, the, to the role of faith in this, but I, I certainly agree with you that it's, it's absolutely central, and I mean, at one point uh, in the in the book, y Jonas recognizes that, you know, even if old ethics aren't good anymore, there might be something to be said if you could sort of revive r revive religion. He just doesn't think that that's really a possible route to anything, um, but you know, I, I think it is. Um, the tool thing, yeah, I mean, sh sure. But our, our, I mean, our, it, I think it also is true that our, our tools change us, right? I, I think that's just an unavoidable part of, of what it means to be users of technology. Uh, I mean, apparently th th they do this in a very literal way. They, you know, you use a hammer l enough and the brain eventually starts treating it as it treats your hand, right? So, you know, the, knowing that's true, right, knowing that we kid ourselves if we say, oh, it's just a tool, you know, um, I think is an important step towards a full appreciation of the impact these things are having on us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rubin. My name is Spencer. I'm a sophomore here at Hillsdale. Um, you mentioned uh, just before your rebuttal of, of Jonas that uh, ecological destruction is not the chief concern, it's more willful destruction of humanity. So my question is, um, do you see things like, uh, was mentioned militarizing or, you know, technology advancing in a military capacity and sort of destroying humans physically being the chief concern or something where humans lose their humanity but perhaps are still alive, um, similar to what C.S. Lewis would call men without chests? Where do you see the greater threat? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I, certainly the, the Lewis uh, uh, problem remains a, a very serious problem, but I also think in some ways we've, we've gone beyond it. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the well, Hans Moravec was mentioned this afternoon. I mean, Hans Moravec was one of the great early thinkers of the transformation of human beings into machines. Um, and and I, I really mean great, because there's a kind of honesty about Moravec's presentation of it that is not necessarily available across the board. But, but you know, you see in him this, it's absolutely, he, he's looking at a world without human beings, he's looking at a world where intelligence is now instantiated in, 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 in mechanisms, and it's great, it's, you know, it's like the Borg are here and he loves them. I mean, it's, it's and, and, you know, you, uh, 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 Ray Kurzweil, uh, another major figure in this, um, they actively are seeking a replacement for humanity. Uh, Kurzweil puts his usual delicacy, he puts it this way. You know, this is gonna happen, he thinks. This is gonna happen. And you know what, he says, if, if you wanna be mortal, fine, go be mortal. That's a problem that will solve itself. Hi, um, Dr. Rubin, my name is Hannah, and I just wanted a clarification on something you said. 
or the author that you're speaking on said, um, human nature and condition are no longer fixed. Um, was that something of the author or of something you believe? So, so that's Jonas, Jonas's description of our present world. We now have the capacity to alter our nature as we see fit. Uh, and I think descriptively, he's right. We, if, even if we don't quite have that capacity yet, it looks pretty clear like we are on the very verge of, of gaining that capacity. Hi, Dr. Jonas, up, or not Dr. Jonas, Dr. Rubin over here. Um, so you spoke about the um, dangers of having research that extends life past normal limits. Would you say that, not trying to play devil's advocate, but you know, research that focuses on curing terminal diseases like cancer, would you consider that unethical then? No. No, I mean, the, there's a difference between, in my mind anyway, there's a difference between the extension of lifespan through curing diseases, which is what we saw in the 20th century, basically, curing or preventing disease, and the extension of lifespan through altering our genetic makeup in order to push us beyond the, you know, anything like a normal lifespan. You know, we're not talking about people here who would be, you know, in, 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 in Yiddish you say, you know, you know, you should live 120 years. No. <laughs> we're, 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 we're way beyond that, conceptually speaking. You know? 120 years, fine. Hello, my name is Gabriel. I'm a junior here at Hillsdale College. So you had mentioned earlier, in response to a question over here, that we need to like clean our own house first, and how our older ethics relate to other West, non-Western cultures. But to what extent, even in the Western culture, if we have these older ethics that are more objective on something farther back, to what point, when do we stop and engage these other changing, more flexible ethics? Is there a point where we have to say no and put our foot down? I know you're not a politician, so I'm not asking for like legislation, but in our personal lives, how are we supposed to engage with our ethics to this modern ethics? Yeah, I mean, so I guess I, guess I am, uh, and this may be a weakness in the argument, but I, but I guess I'm a great believer in the power of example, right? Of, of, of putting your money when your mouth is. You, you know, you lead your life yourself with like-minded people. Uh, you, you make your choices uh, along these lines. And if you're right, it'll, people will see it. People will see the difference, you know? I mean, the, the moral world is, for so many people these days, so chaotic that it seems to me hard to believe that if they saw, you know, people like themselves who were happy and, you know, reasonably successful and able to, you know, not live from one paycheck or one day to the next, you know, you, you, they might start wondering, you know, what, what she got that I haven't got, right? I mean, what's, what's the difference here? Um, look, my, the, the order that runs my, um, my university is, I am told, the only Catholic order that's allowed to operate in North Africa, uh, in the Arab world. And why is that? Uh, because they don't actively proselytize. So is there really nothing in it for them? No, of course there's something in it for them, right? The power of example is where they've placed their bet, it seems to me. We have time for one more question. Thank you so much. Um, this isn't really so much a question. Uh, this afternoon I was discussing that I hoped with a student 
that I hope this week would raise the moral issues as much as the technological issues. I think they're inextricable. And I said, I think just because we have the capacity to do something doesn't mean we should. And so to connect with the old ethics, we have to ask ourselves, should I do it? And if I should do it, why should I do it? And if I shouldn't do it, why should I not do it? And there it is. It's simple, but it's not easy. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.